So um, today, uh, what I will be talking about is uh, materials design at scale uh, through automation and machine learning. So uh, I'm a professor at uh, UC San Diego and my lab is called the Materials Virtual Lab. So we are a pure computational uh, materials lab uh, focusing on applying first principle calculations and machine learning to develop new materials, right? So let me first start with why we are doing all this, right? And uh, Christine has already talked a lot about this in her talk, so I'm not going to go through it too much. But I would say that the fundamental question that we all have as material scientists is, what are the properties for a given collection of atoms, right? And once we know that, we can then do uh, cool things with materials. We can find new materials for our uh, future solar cells, for our future lithium-ion batteries, or whatever uh, application that we want. Uh, to, to have, right? So I want to introduce this concept of what is called, uh, what I call the materials property prediction velocity. Uh, in other words, what's the number of predictions of properties you can make per second, right? And traditionally, I mean, the only way you can get material properties is basically through lab experiments. And we all know that lab experiments, uh, they are painstaking, they are slow, and uh, there has been some statistics which say that, well, it takes about, on average, about 20 years and billions of dollars to actually bring a material from the first time it is found in the lab to actual um, commercialization, right? So as Christine has mentioned, um, today we, we, with computation, we have uh, something that can uh, produce predictions at a much faster velocity, right? So with first principle calculations, we plug the showing the equation into a computer and uh, out spits out a property. Right, and um, that was basically when uh, the time when I uh, towards the 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 start of my PhD, uh, that was what I did. Right, so I basically um, I was in the same group as uh, Christine Pearson, which is uh, with uh, with uh, Professor Gert Cedar, and uh, what what we did was we basically spent uh, all our time creating input files to basically just run a calculation on either a single material or just maybe tens of material. Right. And by the end of my PhD, things have significantly changed, right? So uh, together with Christine, as well as Anabab Jane and a few others uh, in the materials project, we developed software that allow us to automate such calculations. And with that, again, our throughput of calculations has, uh, has significantly increased. And that uh, led to projects like the materials project, uh, which is now this uh, open database that uh, is freely available to everyone uh, in the world, right? So uh, since Christine has already covered the materials project in great detail, I'm actually not going to talk about any of this. Uh, today, I really want to talk about what's next, right? And how do we get from what we have today, which is the materials project and first principle calculations, to even faster um, predictions, but greater number of predictions per second, right? And uh, this, I believe, is basically where machine learning comes in, right? Now, you may ask yourself, well, we can, we can plug our equations into a computer, right? Why do we need machine learning, right? And this is going to be the only time I show uh, actual mater uh, materials project data, okay? And this is the data history of the uh, materials project, right? So materials project started uh, back in 2012. Um, and since then, we have, you can see that the total number of properties uh, have grown, right? So if you look at the red line, this basically shows you the uh, number of uh, energies or structures that we have in the materials project. And by the time we hit 2019 or 2020, uh, we already have about 130,000 uh, materials in the materials project, right? Now, um, similarly, about half of the materials, we actually have uh, computer band structures for them. And, but if you look at other properties, like for example, the elastic tensors, uh, we have about an order, uh, several orders of magnitude lower number of uh, prop, uh, um, um, data points, right? So for, uh, in terms of elastic tensors, we only have about 13,000 data points, and they are even more expensive to compute properties like phonons, which we have even fewer data points. Now, even though we have uh, done a lot in the past, uh, I would say 10 years, almost 10 years or so, nine years, okay? Um, the thing is that we will never be able to cover the entire space of uh, for materials design, right? Because materials design is fundamentally combinatorial, right? So if I take a naive estimate of, let's say I just take a basic perovskite uh, two by two by two supercell and I plug in 10 different A species and 10 different B species, I essentially already get about 10 to the power of seven potential uh, combinations of uh, structures, right? And this without taking into account symmetry. But this just gives you an idea of what is the kind of 
compositional um, um, space that we are dealing with, right? Now, the good news though is that um, with all the developments that have been happening in the past uh, decade or so, um, we have now crossed the threshold of uh, having enough data to actually do reasonable machine learning, right? So once you have about on the order of a few hundred to a thousand data points, uh, you can begin to build reasonable machine learning models. Once you cross the threshold of about 10,000 data points, you are into the deep learning uh, territory. Okay, you can actually now play around with really sophisticated models, right? So the general idea here is really that we want to machine learn from the data that we already have and trying to predict everything else in that's uh, out there that we um, have not computed, right? Or at the very least, we want to get a good guess at what those properties will be before we actually do uh, density functional theory calculations or do experiments on them, right? Now, so um, basically this is the outline for the rest of my talk. I'm going to start by talking about how do we go about building reliable machine learning models for material science. Then I'm going to show you some examples where we have actually uh, designed novel materials with machine learning, which have already been um, um, uh, confirmed and synthesized in the lab. Now, um, in the final part of my talk, I'm going to talk about um, two very big topics in machine learning, which is first of all, we all know that materials data is very, uh, tends to be scarce and it tends to be heterogeneous. How do we go about addressing that materials data problem? Uh, with uh, the design by designing our machine learning algorithms, okay, and also how can we learn new chemistry from machine learning models, okay? So things that we did not know before, right? So uh, let's start with the first topic, okay? So a general workflow for uh, building a machine learning uh, model for material science is uh, as follows, right? So uh, we always start with the first, uh, the target problem in mind, all right? And this is where our domain knowledge as a material scientist come in. So we ask ourselves, well, whether the problem is worth solving, can the problem be actually solved by easier means, right? So if we, if we can compute it, if you are only say looking at a hundred structure, small structures, there's really no reason to use machine learning model as all, at all, all right? And um, of course, even if you, the problem cannot be solved by simpler means, can machine learning even be the solution, right? Can the target actually be learned? Now, once you have that, uh, once you have convinced yourself of the three points, then um, that the next step is basically data collection, right? And for this, as I mentioned, we already have um, a good amount of data sources out there. Uh, other than the o materials project, there's uh, projects such as the OQMD, there's the Nomad project in Europe, there's uh, Aflow, and there's also all your experimental databases that are out there. Now, um, more frequently though, other than using existing data sources, you also need to generate some data uh, by yourself. And for this, there's also um, software frameworks that have been developed to actually help you uh, automate some of those calculations and generate, da generate data in high throughput, right? Um, then the next step is basically uh, mod model choice and featureization. In other words, how do you describe materials, right? And this is uh, where I'm going to spend the majority of my talk uh, today. And uh, finally, you plug the um, uh, features into your machine learning model. And for this, you already have plenty of open source codes out there, such as uh, TensorFlow, Scikit-Learn, as well as material science specific software codes that uh, enable you to do uh, machine learning. So I'm definitely not going to spend any amount of time on the training piece, okay? So those are well established and I'm going to spend uh, all my time on just the middle piece and the final piece, which is how do you actually apply the machine learning models that you have built, right? To do useful stuff, right? So um, the thing about machine learning models is that um, when you design the features, you always need to ensure that uh, the features themselves obey known laws of physics and chemistry uh, in so, as far as possible, right? So there are um, inviolable uh, laws that we actually know, okay? So things like the laws of thermodynamics, whether a property is an extensive property or intensive property. We also have some sense of locality, right? So for example, when we think about a collection of atoms, we think we know that atoms that are close by tend to have stronger interactions with each other than atoms that are far away. Um, there's also the concept of symmetry, right? So when you, 
um, translate a crystal or you rotate a crystal or you reflect a crystal or you permute the same uh, atoms of the same type in the crystal, um, all those should not change the property of your material uh, at all, right? Now, um, so the type of, um, one of the types of uh, materials representation that we really like to work with is what is uh, our mathematical graphs. And so graphs are actually a very natural representation for uh, either crystals or molecules, right? In these graphs, essentially what we think of is that the nodes in the graph are basically the atoms uh, in your crystal or molecule. And the ages are basically the uh, bonds uh, between the atoms, right? So in what we call materials graph networks, uh, basically what you do is that you have vectors representing each of the bonds and atoms, as well as an additional vector that represents the global state of your system, right? So things like maybe the temperature, the pressure, or the entropy of the system. And you then perform a sequence of sequential updates, right? And these updates essentially can be thought of as information flow between the various elements of your graph, right? So for example, uh, the first step may be a bond update where you have basically um, the atoms that are connected to one particular bond are flowing information to that bond itself as well as information flow from the global state, and that then change, uh, updates your bond vector. Now, uh, you can do the same thing with your atoms, and you can do the same thing with your state. And once you complete this sequence of three steps, you basically have what we call a, a materials graph network block, right? Now, um, the nice thing about this kind of materials graph network blocks is that you can actually stack, uh, they are actually a very modular architecture. You can stack multiple blocks together to basically generate uh, models of arbitrary complexity and locality of interactions, right? So for example, if you believe that a property requires uh, atoms to be able to see atoms that are much further away, you can have a, a materials graph network uh, model that have many more blocks, right? And while if it is a relatively simple property, you may actually only need one block to basically get a good prediction, right? Now, um, we have actually implemented uh, our materials graph network uh, models in uh, open so uh, uh, in this uh, GitHub repo over here, and this is actually uh, completely open, and you can uh, get that uh, implementation open source at this uh, link over here if you're interested. Now, so um, the first thing we tested it with is, of course, uh, materials project crystals, right? And uh, the, the reason is very simple. I, I'm, part of, uh, I'm part of the materials project. I had a huge hand in helping uh, build up the materials project. So I'm very familiar with the data that is in the materials project. So we took um, four properties from the materials project, um, things like the formation energy of all the crystals, um, the band gaps uh, of, uh, of the crystals, and the bulk modulus and shear modulus, right? And essentially what we can show is that uh, materials graph network models can actually predict all these properties to a very high degree of accuracy. Uh, and in fact, um, it, it is one of the most accurate machine learning models that have been uh, among uh, all the ones that, have been, uh, that are out there, right? And um, for example, uh, for the formation energy, we can count uh, the, er the mean absolute error in the prediction in the formation energy is about 28 milli electron volt per atom, right? Now, um, you, you may wonder, well, is 28 milli electron volt per atom actually good enough, right? Uh, there's, and in fact, it is, right? So there has been, uh, there's this work that was done back in 2016 by Sun et al, which shows that about up to about 90, 80 to 90% of the crystal in the inorganic crystal structure database, which are mostly crystals that have been already synthesized by experimentalists, um, about 80 to 90 percent of them have uh, energy above uh, the ground state of at, uh, about uh, 50, 60 to 70 milli electron volt per atom, right? And so this 28 MeV per atom is actually uh, well within that uh, threshold. And so uh, what this simply means is that uh, being able to predict the formation energy to within 28 milli electron volt per atom already allows us to make a good guess at whether a crystal is likely to be stable or not, okay? Now, similarly, um, you can see that the um, error in the band gap for, uh, the mean absolute error in the band gap prediction is about 0 0.33. Again, this is reasonably good, okay? 
but uh, I, I want to point out that this is a very uh, is a fairly accurate prediction of a very inaccurate band gap to begin with, right? So we all know that the the band gap predicted by uh, standard density functional theory is uh, um, severely underestimates the true band gap of materials. So uh, while we actually can get a good estimate of the PBE band gap, this really doesn't mean uh, much in the context of things, right? Now, so how do we, given that we are able to build machine learning models that have a reasonably high degree of accuracy, how do we then go about building, uh, designing new materials with uh, machine learning, right? So almost all the um, high accuracy machine learning models out there are what we call structure-based models. In other words, the crystal structure is an input to the model itself, right? Now, um, there are also compositional based models. In other words, uh, you are trying to predict, for example, say Fe203 has a certain band gap, right? And you're not taking into account the fact that Fe203 may have uh, several different polymorphs, right? And this can be quite fatal depending on the kind of application you have in mind, right? So the classic example is, of course, um, carbon, right? You have graphite and you have diamond. Uh, one is a black uh, soft solid and the other one is a very hard transparent uh, material, right? So quite obviously the properties of materials tend to depend very strongly on uh, how the atoms are arranged, right? So the way that most machine learning models, uh, materials machine learning models are used now is basically you start with some initial guess of a novel, uh, novel material, right? So for example, um, as a, a material scientist, I may say, well, I know SRTIO3 is very good for my optoelectronic op application. Uh, what happens if I substitute titanium with cobalt? What kind of, uh, maybe does this improve the property of the, um, the desired property of that I have, right? Now you can, uh, you have two choices, which are uh, basically you can uh, do the compositional based model, which uh, are inaccurate, or you have the choice of basically just doing the substitution and then you go through this really expensive DFT calculation uh, to get your um, re uh, relaxed crystal structure, and then you finally use the more accurate machine learning models to uh, calculate the, uh, to, to predict the properties, right? So essentially you are choosing between the devil and the deep blue sea, right? So um, neither option seems uh, particularly attractive, right? So uh, what we have done is that since we have an energy model, which is the uh, materials graph network model, which can predict the formation energy to a reasonable degree of accuracy, uh, we can then couple that um, formation energy model with Bayesian optimization to actually re pre-relax crisp structure before we actually do a machine learning uh, model uh, prediction, right? So we call this uh, Bayesian optimization with symmetry relaxation. What this simply means is that uh, instead of just optimizing all the coordinates and all the lattice parameters of a crystal, we use we assume that the symmetry is going to remain uh, unchanged. In other words, we only allow constrained variables to actually relax with our um, uh, Bayesian optimization with symmetry relaxation algorithm, right? Or we, what we call Bowser, right? So it, for those of you who are familiar with the uh, Nintendo Super Mario games, uh, Bowser is this uh, villain, uh, the, the key villain in your uh, Nintendo game, right? Now, what does this ha have to do with uh, machine learning model predictions? And it turns out quite a lot, right? So this basically shows you what's the effect of doing this step, the Bowser uh, relaxation step on machine learning uh, predictions. So what we have done is that we have taken a large number of uh, crystals from the materials project. We then generate hypothetical versions of them by substituting atoms which are the same uh, in the same structure prototype uh, with with diff other elements, right? And what we generate is a huge number of uh, unrelaxed crystal structures, uh, and then we then uh, make use our magnet um, machine learning models to basically predict things like the formation energy, the the log ten of the bulk modulus and the shear modulus, right? And what we can show is that basically, if you do not relax the crystal at all, essentially your machine learning model performs poorly, right? You have this huge mean absolute error of uh, 300 MeV per atom. And uh, basically this is uh, almost useless, right? You can't actually come to a conclusion of whether a material is likely to be stable or not uh, with a 300 MeV per atom error, right? Now, once you actually use this uh, Bowser algorithm to actually pre-relax the crystal structure, you can then get 
a much better prediction, right? So uh, th using that as the input structure, we can uh, obtain a mean absolute error. Uh, we can get a formation energy error of about 88 MeV per atom. Now, this is not the 28 MeV per atom that was promised previously because those were based on DFD structures, but it is much closer, right? So at least at 88 MeV per atom, we can use it in some way, right? Now, this is also the case uh, in our bulk modulus and shear modulus. Uh, we can show that essentially, once you do this pre-relaxation step, you actually significantly improve the predictions from your uh, machine learning uh, models, right? Now, um, so uh, how, how can this be applied? Essentially, uh, what we have done is to basically apply this algorithm to discover new ultra incompressible hard materials, right? So uh, the way we did this is basically we took about 500, uh, about 5,500 uh, ternary prototype structures. Okay, we then did elemental substitutions on all of them to generate uh, compounds in this ternary space. Right, basically compounds that contain molybdenum, tungsten, osmium, and rhenium, as and using uh, with borons and carbon as the anion. Essentially, we are looking for uh, borides and carbides. Right now. Um, after running through this um, um, combinatorial expansion process, we basically generate about 400,000 um, candidates. And using the Bowser algorithm, which is uh, very, very fast, certainly much faster than DFT, we can then obtain some pre-relaxed crystal structures, which is uh, the same number, 400,000. And then we plug it into our uh, magnet uh, machine learning models to basically predict things like the uh, formation energy, the bulk modulus and shear modulus, and we then screen out materials that have uh, they are likely to be unstable or are too not uh, not hard enough uh, in this uh, based on our machine learning model predictions, right? And eventually, uh, after this uh, screening process, uh, we end up with about a thousand six hundred um, uh, candidates, and a thousand six hundred is definitely much closer to the number that we can do high throughput DFT with and then we plug it into our uh, DF, uh, high throughput DFT code to basically calculate uh, all the same properties but using accurate DFT calculations this time around and after we finish all our screening criteria based on the DFT calculation we get about 143 candidates and eventually um, eight of them were selected for synthesis right so um, my colleague Tian Luo, is, who is also in UCSD, then uh, went ahead to try to synthesize uh, these eight candidates, and we found that two of the materials, uh, we, uh, he successfully synthesized two of these materials, which is this uh, rhenium tungsten borite co compound and this moly tungsten co carbide compound. Uh, both are predicted to be uh, reasonably stable with uh, very high bulk modulus, and uh, these are completely new compounds that has actually been never uh, that has never been reported, right? He also proceeded to measure the bulk and shear modulus of this compound using uh, pulse echo uh, and as well as uh, nano indentation and, uh, and as well as the hardness using nano indentation. And uh, basically, what you can see here is that um, the predictions from our magnet models are actually in a fairly good agreement with the pulse echo measurements, right? as well as the nano indentation. So this is actually a proof of concept that um, machine learning models can actually have a um, key role to play in greatly expanding the space that you can search for new materials, right? So for example, we, we remember we started off with 400,000 uh, potential crystals, right? And this is not a number that you can reasonably compute uh, using DFT calculations. Now you Probably you can uh, if you are given um, three years worth of uh, computing resources as, at a large supercomputing center, but uh, this is not something that you will want to attempt, right? Be given that most of these are likely to be uh, not stable or not uh, hard enough for the uh, application that you have in mind. All right. Right. Okay. So uh, with that, I want to move on to the uh, next stage of my talk, which is uh, talking about uh, various, how do we go about addressing various um, bottlenecks in applying machine learning models to materials design, right? And the first one is the data problem, right? So it is very well known that um, in material science, high value data, in other words, things like experimental measurements or very, very accurate calculations such as those done using HSE or higher order methods tend to be very scarce, right? 
uh, quite simply because they take more more time to compute or measure, uh, you basically have fewer of that those data, right? Now, um, the classic example I like to show is, uh, for example, the band gap of crystals, okay? From the materials project, we can get about 52,000 uh, PBE band gaps, okay? So this is a functional that uh, is the classic semi-local de density functional theory, uh, functional that uh, most people use nowadays, okay? It is well known to be wildly inaccurate in terms of the band gap, all right? And, uh, but if you look at something like the HSC band gaps, uh, we have only about uh, 6,000 data points, which is uh, about an order of magnitude uh, smaller, right? And if you look at things like the experimental band gaps, we have even fewer of those, right? About uh, 2,700 of them, right? Now, the question is, why do we actually have to build a machine learning model that only learns from the PBE band gaps? Why can't we learn from all available data, right? Now, why can't, so the magnet model that you saw previously, that was only trained on this uh, orange space that you see here, which is just the PBE band gaps, right? Is there a way that we can utilize all the available data and end up with a better uh, prediction on every single thing, right? And this is what uh, we are trying to do, right? And this is basically takes inspiration from uh, how we humans actually uh, make decisions, right? So we humans, we do not make, we typically do not make decisions based on one source of data, all right? We make decisions by aggregating multiple sources of uh, information. So for example, let's say you are thinking about buying uh, stock in Tesla, right? Uh, you may go ahead and read some news about how the sage of Omaha, Warren Buffett himself, is thinking about Tesla stock. You may hear, listen to a few podcasts like, for example, Jim Cramer, uh, who will tell you to buy Tesla stock. Uh, your, your Uncle Joe may actually have his own opinion about whether uh, Tesla stock is good. But if you are really, really good, what you should really be doing is to you go to the Tesla financials and then you try to figure out for yourself whether uh, Tesla is uh, worth buying, right? So, but you do uh, aggregate multiple sources of information. So starting from the uh, materials graph network model that we uh, talked about previously, what we then did was to basically develop a way in which we can incorporate data from multi-fidelities. In other words, data that are Dif generated differently into the machine learning model itself, right? So remember in our materials graph network, other than the bond and edges, we have this uh, global state uh, variable, right? Which we previously used to represent uh, the overall state of a material. Now, instead of the overall state of a material, here we then uh, embed the data fidelity information, right? So for example, we set our PBE data to have a data fidelity of zero, and then HSC to have a data fidelity of two and experimental back gaps to have a data fidelity of three. We then uh, pass it through an embedding to basically generate this uh, fidelity embedding vector. And then what we then, the rest of the model remains exactly the same as before. We did not change any of our atom or edge uh, variables. And then we use all sources of data to basically um, train a machine learning model, right? Now, does that work? And it turns out that it does, right? So um, what we found was that this, this is actually the result, the mean absolute error in the band gap uh, for our single fidelity models. In other words, what if we just use our materials graph network model on each of the data set in turn, right? So for example, our PBE band gap, uh, we have, uh, re remember we have an error of about 0 0.33. This error is slightly lower because this is based on the newer set of data. So that data actually has more data points and it's also more accurate. So um, we have a slightly lower error here. Uh, but as you can see, um, for the GLBSC, which is another function that is widely, uh, that is used for predicting band gaps as well as HSE and experiment ba band gaps, our mean absolute error are much higher, right? And the main reason is because, well, we have much fewer data points, right? So we can't really train our machine learning model that well, right? Now, when we um, incorporate multiple fidelities of data into the model, so for example, our two fidelity model where we add PBE data together with one each of the high fidelity data sets in turn, or we use a four fidelity model in which we actually use all the data in, at once. What we found was that basically we can get at least a 40 to 50% improvement in the high value uh, HSE and experimental bank gaps predictions, right? And this is huge, right? So 
you notice that now uh, our HSE predictions and our experimental bank gap predictions are now almost, I mean, they are still slightly higher, but they are almost on par with our um, um, PBE bank gap predictions, right? And what in, in essence, we, it seems that it's magical, right? We have managed to get something for free. We have, we still have very little HSE and experimental bank gap data, but somehow our, um, uh, our predictions on those data have significantly improved, right? Now, um, I want to convince you that this is not uh, sorcery, right? So basically the reason why this works was is really because um, there's something going on in the underlying latent structural features of our materials graph network models, right? So when we do not use the PPE data and we just uh, plot, for example, the bank gap uh, together with the latent structural features uh, in a TSNE plot, right? Uh, what we found was that basically for the small data sets, you actually have this uh, um, a, a not a very good separation between your high bank gap and uh, low bank gap materials, right? In other words, your latent structural features are not particularly effective in uh, representing trends in the uh, bank gap. Now with the large PBE data, which is uh, 50,000 data points, um, what you see is that now your latent structural features actually significantly improve in resolution, right? They are a, you can see that most of the high bank gap materials fall in this region and most of the low bank gap materials actually fall in this region. And we believe that it is this uh, improvement in the latent structural features from using your low fidelity data that is enabling your high fidelity data model to basically uh, make better predictions, right? Even though the data set is still smaller, right? Okay, now um, finally, um, I want to show you how uh, we can actually learn uh, new chemistry from machine learning models, right? So, um, so first of all, um, if you recall, when we uh, did our materials graph network models, uh, what we did was that we represent each of the atoms using this atom number embedding, right? So we gave it the atomic number of the element, and then uh, we uh, insert this into a 16, length 16 vector, and then the machine learning model then automatically learns what is the most reasonable uh, atomic number, uh, most reasonable vector for each of the elements, right? Now, uh, interestingly, when we actually take this uh, length 16 vector and then we plot it, uh, plot the correlation between this uh, length 16 vectors for all the elements, what we found was that we are able to uh, reproduce essentially the periodic table of the elements, right? So this is uh, a plot that is uh, the correlation plot that is plotted in order of Mendeleev number, okay, just to make sure that we have all the groups in, um, together. And what you essentially see uh, is what you expect uh, from the periodic table, right? You have um, elements that are uh, very chemically similar uh, being um, having very high correlation numbers, right? So for example, all your alkali metals are highly correlated, uh, all your transition metals are highly correlated, and all your um, uh, rare earths are highly correlated, right? And if you do the TSNE projection, you can also see that there is a quite a, a very clear grouping of elements based on um, their chemical properties, right? So for example, the alkali metals are here, uh, and uh, the rare earths are over here, and he uh, the transition metals are all over here, right? So um, in other words, what we see is that the machine learning model through the, uh, by, through the process of trying to learn the relationship between the input structure and the formation energy, they seem to have learned something new, right? They have learned the, what is the relationship between the different elements, right? And this is actually knowledge that we can use, right? So how do we use this knowledge? Uh, one way is to basically um, enhance our machine learning model development. So, uh, the previous model type of models that we sh I showed you was basically multi-fidelity models. But another way to basically speed up machine learning model development is through what is called transfer learning, right? So, for example, if we take our formation energy model, which is uh, which has the most data points, say sixty thousand. Nowadays, we we have actually more than hundred thousand data points, and we just take this embedding vector, the element embedding vector, and we transfer it to another model with fewer data points. And we still keep the rest of the architecture the same, but we actually then retrain the model, but with this um, embedding as a starting, uh, as a, essentially a starter, right? Uh, what we found was that we can decrease, improve the performance quite a fair bit, okay? From uh, the bank gap model, we can decrease our 
mean absolute error from about 0.38 EV to about 0.32 EV. And we can actually also speed up the convergence of the model by a significant amount, right? Uh, up to about uh, 2x, right? So in other words, um, that machine learning chemistry can actually help our machine learning model uh, learn faster and also learn more accurately, right? Now, we can also use the machine learning chemistry to address completely new uh, problem spaces, right? And uh, I will show you this uh, example, right? So this is aluminum nitride and this is aluminum gallium nitride. And I can tell you that um, as a theorist, right? Um, this is our favorite type of uh, crystal structure, right? It's very simple. There are very few atoms. Uh, if I plug it into a computer, even trying to solve the Schrodinger equation is not going to take me more than an hour, right? So we love this kind of uh, models. Uh, but the fact is that more than 50% of known materials are actually of the second form that you see over here, right? So in fact, disordered materials, either through doping or just through simple mix, uh, solid solutions of uh, different uh, elements, okay? actually forms the majority of the elements that you see in the world today, right? And most technological materials, definitely not uh, our nice, pure aluminum nitride type material, okay? Yeah. Uh, and the problem is also that this, this type of um, crystal structure is um, notoriously difficult for theorists to model, okay? So we have ways of modeling this. We can uh, generate uh, what are known as quasi-random structures and then try to compute the properties and hope that that quasi-random structure is actually a good ap enough approximation to the actual disordered structure. Now, uh, using our machine learning chemistry, we can actually do something much more elegant and sophisticated, right? Uh, basically, can, the question that we asked was basically, can we interpolate the machine learned uh, chemical descriptions, right? So, if we want to represent this, um, this what we call a disordered site, in which uh, this site which is uh, has a probability of 50% uh, being aluminum and 50% being gallium, can we then easily just take, well, um, our um, elemental embedding for aluminum, uh, multiply it by uh, 0.5, and then we add it to our elemental embedding for gallium, and then uh, multiply it by 0.5 and add them together, right? In other words, we just interpolate between uh, the um, embedding vectors between our aluminum and gallium, right? To represent this disorder site that is somewhat in between uh, aluminum and gallium, right? Now, uh, you may think that, well, I mean, can't we do this for all kinds of uh, structural features? Now, this cannot be done for traditional engineered features, right? So if, for example, you are using the atomic number to uh, represent your aluminum or gallium, you cannot do this, right? Because the 50-50 uh, side of aluminum and gallium doesn't be behave like a 50-50 Z number of uh, aluminum and gallium, right? So that doesn't work, right? Now, it turns out that um, the, the machine learning chemistry actually does uh, encode the chemistry well enough that we can actually interpolate for disordered structures, right? So um, I'll show you two examples over here, which is uh, aluminum gallium nitride that I just talked about, and we look at the band gap, and there's actually uh, extensive experimental data that has been collected on this uh, aluminum nit uh, gallium nitride system uh, for anything between zero to one uh, for X in ALX GA one minus X N. And what you see is that our, our machine learning model is actually able to predict the, band the trend in the band gap with uh, composition uh, very, very well, right? Uh, similarly, there's this um, um, Garnet structure, which is a lutetium uh, gallium aluminum system. And we actually show you a few example, other examples in our paper over here, uh, where we were able to predict the band gap, at least the trends in the band gap uh, to a very reasonable degree of accuracy. And re I remind you that this is extremely fast, right? So there's almost no time at all in making these predictions. And this is something that is not easily addressed uh, by your traditional DFT calculations, right? Okay, so uh, I'm going to uh, conclude soon. Um, I'm going to just uh, really talk about uh, what's next, okay? And um, so the challenge is still data, okay? So there's too little data in a lot of instances. There's data prejudice. Uh, you will see that there's so much data on perovskites if you look at the literature, uh, but there's much fewer data on other kind of chemical systems. And there's also um, problems where we essentially have no good uh, theoretical methods or uh, either uh, experimental methods, right? So 
um, the opportunities are really uh, we can try to uh, improve our collection of data through either combinatorial experiments, uh, which uh, is also a very hot topic right now, or we can also improve theory. Uh, those are ideal, very challenging, but uh, much more practical. Uh, as I have shown you, our multi-fidelity models actually work quite well. We can do transfer learning. Uh, and my colleague at, uh, um, in the materials project, Anna Bajain, has uh, in recent years uh, tried to use text mining to essentially quite to try to collect all the data that we actually have, uh, already have, right? Now, the second uh, challenge is in terms of models. Uh, we want the models to actually learn our proper chemis uh, chemistry and physics. And um, in, in essence, we want to avoid descriptor soup, right? So uh, I... I'm generally not a fan of machine learning models, which says I'm going to throw 100 features at the problem and hopefully the machine learning model spits out something that's accurate enough. Um, so um, I, I prefer to really try to think about what features should matter in the machine learning model, right? So um, the, the opportunities here are really trying to further introduce our physics and chemical intuition into the machine learning models that we built, okay? And I believe that that will actually allow us to extrapolate into unknown spaces, right? So Christine talked about this a little bit. Um, we are very good at interpolating within the space that we train the model on, but it is very bad when we try to uh, extrapolate, right? But I think if you introduce, uh, if you introduce physics and chemistry into the machine learning model, that uh, problem can be partially solved at least. And finally, uh, we, of course, the holy grail of materials design is what's called inverse design, right? Rather than saying well, this structure has this property, we want to say, well, I want a band gap of 1.0. Can you tell me what structure and chemistry is going to give me exactly that voltage, uh, exactly that band gap, right? And th this, in other words, we want invertible representations for our models, okay? So uh, with that, I want to um, first acknowledge the contributions from my group, uh, Dr. Chi Chen, who was uh, uh, responsible for most of the graph network uh, work, and Yun Xing Zhuo, who developed the Bowser algorithm and applied it to the uh, problem that we have at hand. Um, I want to acknowledge funding from the Samsung GRO program, uh, materials project uh, for all the data, um, and um, these are the publications uh, of all the books that uh, of all everything I talk about today. And I also want to uh, finally say that uh, I, we actually set up this website called crystals.ai where you will be able to download all the data sets and models that we have developed from our um, work. Uh, we we be sincerely believe in making everything open source and uh, we, chat, uh, we welcome everyone to come and um, use our data and use our models and try to stress test them. Okay, so and with that, I would like to take uh, any questions.